Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have the very special Dr. Clark today with us, and he focuses on chronic pain. He has some amazing information to share with us today for people out there who struggle with chronic pain or know someone in their family or have a friend that has chronic pain. I want you to listen to this podcast because he has a lot of valuable information to share that you could use maybe to help yourself or to, to share with someone else that has chronic pain in their lives and they want to feel better. So Dr. Clark, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. Well, I'm a physician for starters, and I'm board certified in gastroenterology and internal medicine. And over the last 40 years, uh, I have evaluated and cared for and successfully treated, I have to say, over 7,000 people who were essentially medical mysteries. They had no a biomedical explanation for their pain or illness. They, they went to doctors, sometimes a lot of them, sometimes for years or even decades. They got all the right diagnostic tests and the explanation wasn't showing up. Um, so what I would do is I would evaluate them for what we call brain-generated pain uh, or illness, uh, which is in turn due to stress in the person's life, which can be past or present. And by uncovering the stress, which most of my patients didn't even recognize was there, uh, we were able to find something we could treat. And by treating the stress, the stress level goes down and the physical pain or illness uh, improves. And, you know, in a nutshell, uh, that's what I've been doing since the 1980s. Um, my first book about it was called They Can't Find Anything Wrong. Uh, and I'm the president of the Psychophysiologic Disorders Association for over a decade now. And our mission is to teach other doctors how to do this. You know, I, I think it's wonderful because so many people in our uh, world, you know, especially the United States and everywhere, people suffer from chronic pain. And, and it's it's grueling to have to wake up every morning and, and to feel pain. Most people, when they have chronic pain, they don't want to get out of bed. They suffer from depression. You know, um, they they just lose the, lose the ability to want to enjoy life because when you're in constant pain, it's very hard to, to do anything when you're in pain. And that can help, you know, that can hurt you mentally and physically, of course. So, you know, what, you know, when you started your, your journey on chronic pain and you were looking for more answers and you started to look at, you know, a lot of patients would come and they couldn't find the diagnosis they were going to doctor to doctor to doctor and they still weren't feeling good. What were some of the things that you look for and that you, you maybe some symptoms or maybe some things people should really consider if they have chronic pain and they're not feeling better, they're doing what the doctor says, they go to second opinions, they're still not doing better. You know, what are some of the things people should really, you know, start to uh, look for if, if they're not getting better? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, you know, I started out as the most normally trained doctor in the world. I mean, I got completely usual um, Western style medical training. Um, and the last thing I expected was to run into a patient. I didn't know the first thing about how to diagnose or treat. But in the eighth year of my formal training, um, a patient was referred to my university where I was still in training from another university where they could not figure out why she was having such severe symptoms. And, you know, we had a special test that we did that we thought was going to show the problem. Um, that was normal too. Uh, and I was left to me to kind of do her exit interview and tell her, you know, we're, you're going to have to live with this. We can't, we can't find any reason for it, but just to keep the conversation going, I started asking her about stress and she didn't really have any. And I asked her about stress earlier, thinking maybe, you know, she'd been ill for two years. So I thought, well, maybe something happened uh, that triggered this two years ago. And that was when she started telling me she had been severely abused as a girl by, by her father, unfortunately, tragically. Uh, and I didn't think that, you know, first of all, that came as a shock to me. I had no background in how to respond to something like that. It embarrasses me that I had no training in what to do when a patient tells you something like that. But right. I took the history, I got the information, I hooked her up with a psychiatrist that I had heard about that was interested in these mind to body connections. But I thought, you know, that's going to be largely a waste of time. Well, I ran into the psychiatrist a few months later, psychiatrist had cured this patient with about, you know, two or three months of counseling which just upended my world. You know, yeah. the idea that you could alleviate a serious physical condition 
just by talking to somebody. And this is, you know, these are symptoms are real. These are not in your head. These are not imaginary. Um, these are not in people who are neurotic or weak. This can happen to anybody. Yeah. Uh, so I got Dr. Kaplan, who was the psychiatrist, to teach me her framework. And basically just three um, very simple things to say. Number one, look for stress in your life at the moment. Mm -hmm. Number two, make sure the person doesn't have a hidden case of depression, anxiety, or post-traumatic stress. And number three, which was a, another surprise to me, look for adverse childhood experiences. Look for experiences that the person had as a child, even if it was decades ago, yeah. uh, that you would never want to have for a child of your own. Um, and by just looking into those three things, uh, patient after patient after patient, I would uncover uh, enormous amounts of stress that were fully capable of causing very real symptoms. So when someone has carried stress you know, in their life and they've had a traumatic event occur somewhere along the lines of their, of, of their from childhood from, you know, to the, ad their adulthood, what are some of the things that you do once you find out that they have had um, a traumatic event occur in their life? Now, is, do they, is that something that you would refer to therapy? Like, what's the next step? Okay, they, they have something that happened to them. This is, this is causing stress, which might be uh, irritating some parts of the body or the, the brain, causing other problems in the body. Like, what what's the next step? So once she told you that she had something traumatic happen to her, what was the next step, you know, that, that you, they had to do to help this patient go get along and get Yeah, help? absolutely. There, there is a process there as well. And, you know, we can't, obviously, as much as we'd like to, we can't go back and change the trauma that the person went through as a child. Um, but we can have a significant benefit to the long-term consequences. And those tend to fall into three categories. Number one is uh, stressful personality traits. People who survive a challenging childhood oftentimes have uh, a lot of personality traits that they develop uh, in order to survive that early experience. Um, but they cause problems for them as adults. This can be low self-esteem is a, a big fundamental one. Um, perfectionism being excessively self-critical, not being assertive, uh, a tendency to put the needs of other people in your life uh, ahead of your own needs, uh, limitations in self-care skills where you don't put yourself on the list of people you take care of. And all of those things add up to a very high stress level. But when people see where they came from, uh, when they start imagining a child of their own growing up the same way they did, and how that child might react to that environment, it helps them to make changes. It helps them to feel more positively about themselves. They can recognize the heroic per perseverance that it took to get through that early experience. And they start to think of themselves uh, as strong, um, capable people. And that's, you know, that flips their usual self-image uh, 180 degrees around. So that's that's number one, the personality traits. Number two, are to look for triggers. Uh, some A person, a situation, an event that's in your life right now uh, that is in some way linked to the past traumas. Uh, and as a result of that, it's triggering for you. It's, it's inducing a whole lot of stress for you in the present day. Uh, one of my patients who was uh, hospitalized at a prestigious university 60 times in 15 years, Oh, for wow. attacks of severe vomiting and dizziness. It turned out that, and, and she had, you know, she saw a dozen specialists. They even had a psychiatrist talk to her, but he missed the diagnosis too, unfortunately. Uh, but it turned out that all of these attacks that she had, which were occurring, you know, six to 10 times a year, they were all connected to um, encounters with her mom, who was verbally and emotionally abusive towards her from the age of four onwards. This is a 50 year old woman. And the mom was still doing this to her after all these years. And she never put it together that it was her mom who was the trigger for these. Um, and then number three, I'm looking for repressed emotions, uh, negative emotions, obviously, anger, fear, shame, grief, guilt that a person is carrying with them. Uh, and they're they're not consciously aware of it. They're not able to deal with it uh, verbally. And so it's expressing itself via the body. 
Uh, my one of my most extreme examples of that is a uh, was an 87 year old woman who had been having abdominal pain since she was eight years old. And so the natural question to ask was, well, what happened to you when you were eight? And it turned out that um, she had been caring for a younger sibling from the time the sibling was born until the, the sibling was two and a half. It was a, a younger brother. And unfortunately, you know, and she she did everything for that infant yeah. um, the way uh, any other girl might play with a doll. But mm -hmm. uh, tragically, uh, this uh, younger brother uh, developed appendicitis and died. This was the oh, 1920s. Wow. This was rural Idaho. This was no antibiotics. This was a hospital that was, you know, hours away. There was nothing that could be done. Uh, but of course, you know, as an eight-year-old, she just felt completely responsible, horribly guilty, started having the stomach pains very soon after that. And she was carrying this guilt 79 years later. Wow. But successfully treated. I, you know, we got to have the happy ending. Yeah. Uh, I asked her to write a letter to her deceased toddler brother, just asking for forgiveness and uh, talking about, you know, what it was like to be an eight-year-old uh, and taking care of a, a kid like that. And that, that helped to, you know, unburden all yeah. of that guilt. And she felt uh, much, much better. Wow. That's amazing. Now, if you fall under those three categories, like what's the next step? Is there a different types of, of, of strategies and tools that you might have a person to uh, use dependent on uh, what the situation is, you know, to help them in the healing process? Is that the next step? Yes. Uh, all of these uh, ideas that I've just been sharing uh, come under the heading of what I call pain relief psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other terminology out there, but uh, and there are several different sort of subtypes of this, but they overlap a lot. And they, the difference between this new form of pain psychotherapy and older forms of treatment like cognitive behavioral therapy is that our goal is to relieve your symptoms. We're not just trying to help you live with this. Uh, we are actually trying to make them go away. And the first step is just to realize that if you know when you've got symptoms in your body it's natural to focus on that part of your body and try to yeah. figure out what in the world is wrong with that yeah. uh, part uh, and that's what doctors do as well what we try to do is as a first step shift your attention to your brain where the circuits uh, have actually been rewired by the stress so this is again not an imaginary condition that people have here yeah. the uh, physiology of your uh, brain and nervous system have been anatomically changed by stress. So we want people to shift their attention from what's going on in their body to the brain and from there to stress and try to figure out what the stress is. Because even when your body is really symptomatic, it's trying to tell you something. It is your friend. It is trying to communicate with you that there is a stress going on that simply hasn't been resolved yet, that hasn't been addressed. Yeah. And we need to listen to what the body is trying to say with these uh, symptoms, whether it's pain or some form of illness like irritable bowel syndrome or fibromyalgia um, or chronic fatigue in many cases, and shift our attention to the brain and then to what in the, what stresses are going on either today or from the past. And as people contemplate that, just doing that one step alone uh, opens up a whole world of, of possibilities for a successful treatment. And there's there's more we can get into beyond that, but that's step number one for pain relief psychology. That's a, that's amazing. And what would be, so after you start going through the process of, of really analyzing your inner self and really figuring out what the true cause of, of these emotions are and, and the hurt and the, those, 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 those areas that are, are unhealed when, and then you start working on yourself are, you know, you mentioned about, um, you, you talked about, you know, getting those repressed emotions out and you talked about, um, different, you mentioned one or two different ways. Now, what would be step number two, once you really figured out what was going on and you figure out that there are certain events in my life that are causing stress, which is causing me to have the chronic pain or the symptoms of, you know, that go come along with chronic pain. Now what, you know, step number two. Step number two is to look at, at, you know, the next most difficult step is to look for triggers. 
Look for something that's in your life at the moment that is triggering stress for you. Uh, it may be linked uh, to the past, or it may be that there was an event uh, that happened to you uh, right before your symptoms began uh, that was a trigger. A uh, very simple example was uh, not so simple for the healthcare profession, but was shared uh, with me by a, a colleague uh, in Arizona who told me about a patient who'd been, you know, middle-aged woman, had been to, you know, half a dozen doctors for uh, pain that she was having, uh, couldn't find anything wrong with her. Um, and he was interviewing her and asking her about stress and traumas and so forth. And, and her husband actually was in the room. She didn't even mention this herself. He said, you know, right before she became ill, she was a hostage during the robbery of a store. And she spent half an hour uh, with a handgun pointed at her neck. Uh, oh, and this wow. happened right before the onset of her symptoms. And uh, she had other symptoms of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as well. So it was very clear that that was the diagnosis. That's a, an extreme example of a trigger. Um, so was the um, uh, other example of the patient who'd been verbally and emotionally abused by her mom, and the mom was the trigger. Uh, so looking for those, and, and it can be a, a situation that's you know maybe in your workplace. Uh, one of my colleagues tells a story about a a patient who was being mistreated by his boss in a way that was very much the same as the way his own dad had mistreated him when he was growing up. And it was just uh, building up the tension on him yeah. uh, to the point where he was repressing an impulse to, you know, punch his, his boss out, yeah, uh, which would not have been a good idea. So he had <laughs> to repress that, especially since his boss was, he was a, a male patient and the boss was female. That would have made it even worse. Yeah. Uh, so he had to repress that and it all came into pain in his hand. Oh, uh, wow. But he had no idea that yeah. this was going on beneath the surface. So that's all step number two. And so step number three, the healing and the coping process, is that what comes next? Is that- That's what comes next. So at least in my practice, uh, and in the form of uh, pain psychology called emotional awareness and expression therapy, which is what I have been using for decades. Uh, and the third step in that is to uh, try to uncover any repressed emotions that are going on. And the, the there are two um, main exercises that can help people with that. And the first one is just to imagine yourself a butterfly on the wall of your childhood home. And you are watching a child that you care about uh, either your own or another one, uh, trying to cope with whatever's going on in that household. Because for a lot of my patients, when they look back, um, they are not fully recognizing the the difficulty of what they went through. They've repressed it. Um, they don't have a parallel life to compare with. They're minimizing it. They're just not seeing it accurately for what it really was. But if they look back and they imagine their own kid trying to cope with the same stuff. You know, you see big time facial expression changes when people start to think about that. It's like, oh no, N you know, no way in the world would I want my kid to be in that environment for, you know, even a couple of days. It yeah. would drive me nuts. Um, a patient of mine who, you know, happened to be a fairly well-known uh, public figure uh, told me a story about um, her own family. She was an only child and her parents we're constantly arguing and bickering and insulting and, you know, the verbally abusing each other all day long. And yeah. she, of course, as the only child, tried to be a peacemaker. Um, and she told me about this and it just sounded, you know, and it went on for years. Even when the parents divorced, uh, they kept living in the same house. They slept <laughs> in separate bedrooms. But from her perspective, nothing changed. Yeah, it yeah. Was still just as bad. Right. And she, but at the same time, she's telling me this horrible story. She's saying, you know, I dealt with it. It wasn't too bad. Um, you know, I think I'm past that now. Uh, and she had, she had had 20 years of physical symptoms in her body. Uh, and so I said, OK, we're going to you know, you have this beloved niece. You know, the, you're five years old. You, you love spending time with her. You take yeah. her to, uh, to Disneyland. You take her shopping and all this fun stuff. Uh, what would happen if you're a butterfly on the wall of your childhood home? And you're watching your niece try to cope with your parents. And she just stared at me. You know, she's a very verbal person. She could talk forever, just stopped and looked at me. 
And after a couple of minutes of just processing that, she said, at the end of a week, I would shoot myself. Wow. And that was the first time she recognized the reality of what that had been like for her. Yeah. You know, I think sometimes you, you, you kind of, st- you know, one of the no- things I've noted is that people stay in denial. You know, the problem doesn't go away, but they try to repress it. And they try to make believe like it, it either it's not happened or it never happened because they don't want to face the anguish and 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 the hurt that is is so buried deep inside them. Especially when it's about people that you still care about. Exactly. You know, people can you can have opposite feelings, anger and affection, um, at the same time about the same people that are still in your life, um, but until you bring both of them out into the open and acknowledge that they're both there um then you're gonna your body's gonna keep talking to you let's put it that way yeah so after after step three when we start to go into step four now we've learned we're going through the coping process we're figuring out what's going on we're figuring out you know uh you know understanding where these emotions are coming from and the and the process of healing that that we need to take. What would what would be the next step for for a patient? The next step is after we've identified all of these stresses, we want to do what we can to change them. Yes. Uh, and one of the important steps is after you've recognized the reality of what you went through as a kid. And you know, again, most of my patients had some kind of adverse childhood experience. Yeah. Is just to see that it took heroic perseverance. Uh, to come through that, to endure it, to come out the other end uh, as as a whole person. And yes, you may have had some uh, some struggles with that. You may have had an eating disorder, an addiction, and it's not just necessarily to substances. It can be to uh, exercise or sex or work, um, uh, as well as to uh, you know alcohol or drugs. Um, yes. Or you may have had uh, cutting behavior. Some of my patients repress their emotions so completely that they cut themselves in order to feel something. Uh, Mm -hmm. All of these uh, forms of uh, self-treatment that people feel uh, shame about, um, they're just reactions to very, very difficult situations. And there's no need for shame about them. They are just a measure of the severity of what you went through. So I'm trying to help people um, look at themselves in a in a positive light. Look at themselves uh, as uh, strong, capable people who just happen to have been born in the moral equivalent of the uh, of a dangerous jungle, for example, and to take pride in in having gotten out of there. Right. And you can build your self esteem like that. It it flips a whole lot of um, other issues. Uh, you know, if you start to feel like you're a good person. Mm-hmm. Uh, then you're going to be less tolerant of being treated in a second rate way by relationships that you're in. Right. Uh, That public figure who grew up with the two parents who were battling all the time, as soon as she recognized that she had done an incredible thing to survive that environment, she decided she wasn't going to put up with uh, being treated as anything less than a a wonderful human being. And and she actually dumped her boyfriend the next day. Um, Lots of my patients end up in unbalanced relationships where they are giving a whole lot more than they're receiving. Yes. She just decided, I'm not doing that anymore. Right. And a lot of people, they come from environments where they, they're so used to this dysfunctional behavior that they actually think it's the norm. And when they go out, they actually fall into the same cycle, the same behaviors, the same people, the same energy. And it over and it, over. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think we're on step six now. So after- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, a, another area that is very important is to put yourself on the list of people you take care of. Mm-hmm. Many of my patients, when you ask them what they do for fun or what time they take for their own joy, it's like, you know, they got to think about it. You know, they're, yeah. they're not really doing very much for themselves and they're, right. they're living lives on a, on a treadmill that they never step off. And my goal for them is to carve out a regular space of time where they do trial and error, which can take months yeah. to find something that has no purpose, but your own joy. 
Um, what you want is the moral equivalent of finger paints for a four-year-old. Right. Um, you're old with finger paints, doesn't care about if the work is any good. They don't care how many pictures per hour they produce. They just know they're having a blast. And yeah. that turns out to be an essential human skill that many of my patients missed out on. Right. And a lot of times too, like when uh, you, you could do a lot of healing through artwork too. People don't realize yes. this, but they, you know, a lot of times it comes out in the artwork. It comes out through artistically, you know, you don't even have to be artistic. It's just the color you use, the images, it reminds you of specific things. And you're just actually artistically getting those negative emotions and those imageries out. And then it's kind of clear in that negative energy from you too. It's uh, if you can't put it into words or you don't have experience putting it into words, let it come out um, some other way than uh, through your body. Right. Uh, which reminds me of the next step, which <laughs> is once you recognize uh, what some of these repressed emotions are, uh, we want to put those into words. And very powerful technique uh, for my patients is to write a letter. They don't mail it. They just write it right. uh, to the person who mistreated them. And they put all of those thoughts and feelings down in words, whether it's typed on a screen or handwritten. Uh, can be enormously helpful. The more of that you put onto the page, uh, the less of those emotions needs to be expressed into your body. Yes. Uh, one of my patients took the letter to his father's grave and read it to him. And it took him four or five hours to read the whole thing. And wow. he, said, he told me by the end, he was shouting. Oh, um, wow. But it made a huge difference to his symptoms. The first time he'd felt better in years. He got all those repressed emotions out. Oh. exactly exactly they didn't need to go into his body anymore yeah and i think sometimes too it's like a like a domino effect once you start getting those emotions out other ones start popping up and i'm popping up and you might not even realize you had those emotions and it's just like a domino effect and then all of a sudden it all starts pouring out and releasing from you yeah that that writing just has this magic ability to pull things out of your head um, I always remember one patient of mine who just really didn't want to go there. I mean, I kept saying, if you want to get better, this this writing exercise is going to be the single most effective thing you can do. And, you know, she just wasn't ready for it. Yeah. And she would come back to see me every month or two, and she'd be on the internet, and she'd have some new idea uh, for a diagnostic test I could run or <laughs> uh, some new treatment I should prescribe for her. And I would say, you know, did you write that letter yet? And she, no, not yet. And finally, she just said, okay, Dr. Clark, um, you know, you've been telling me every single time I come in here to write this letter. So I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm going to write a two paragraph letter to my dad. And, but if I do that, you have to stop asking me uh, to, to do this uh, ever again. And I said, you know, I don't think two paragraphs is going to be enough, you know, given the issues that you have with your dad and take it or leave it, she says. So, you know, I figured that was the best I was going to do uh, somewhat against my better judgment. I said, OK, I'll make the deal. I won't I won't say this anymore. You've heard it from me enough. You know, I'm thinking it. Uh, mm -hmm. So she goes off and she writes the two paragraphs and then she writes a third paragraph. And, oh, you know, she's got a few more ideas, writes a fourth paragraph. She ended up with nine single spaced pages mm. typed. Wow. And kept it in a locked desk drawer for years afterwards and finally felt better. I mean, 18 months, she really hadn't improved. After she did that, much, much better. Um, didn't need to come and see me any more than every year or two after that. Wow. That's amazing. You know, it's amazing how, how, how writing has such an effect on people. I even sometimes I would like to put music on that relates to the emotions that I'm, I'm feeling, or, or I know that's going to connect me with my emotions. And it would be something that, you know, that was soft, that was just something that would just trigger my emotions. And a lot of times I would put music on and I would think of a, a specific topic that I knew you know, it, it still hasn't completely healed, you know, that I, that I need to work on. And the music would actually instigate the emotions and it actually would help me, you know, really connect strongly with my, with my emotions that I was feeling inside. 
You know, that sounds like music therapy to me. I have a friend who's a music therapist, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll bet that she uses that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to remember that one. I like that one. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's just, you know, just emotional songs that really trigger your heart. Talk about either love or rejection or this or that, you know, and and, and it's soft and it's it's just it just it just triggers those 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 emotions. And then all of a sudden, other things start to pop in your head. And it's just, you know, it's just emotional music of all different sorts, you know, and it starts making you think about, you know, and I would put music that was written maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago from my time. And it would bring me back into the past, you know, and, and it would be soft. So it was hidden by emotions. And then all of a sudden, all these things would just pop and I could just feel it coming from my heart and my insides. And then I would start to write. And then I would, I would, you know, thoughts would just start flowing through my mind and it just gets it out. And then sometimes you don't even realize, but there are certain things that, that were bothering you that you didn't even realize until those words in the song kind of clicked in your heart. And then all of a sudden these, these emotions from inside yourself just like pour out. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, you're what you're achieving there is you're removing the barriers. You're you're giving um, your conscious mind a safe place um, in which to let uh, some of these very difficult issues uh, come up. That's um, that's a wonderful technique. Yeah, you know, thank you very much. But now I'm kind of I'm kind of curious that what's the next step. All right. Well, we're still <laughs> working on the stresses. And okay. We, if we identify triggers. Uh, then we need to set some boundaries uh, between yourself and those triggers mm -hmm. so that you've got a safe place, that you're not having your physical health impacted by what's triggering you. Now, yes. you know, if it's your boss, um, you know, you're not going to be able to fire your boss uh, and you're going to have a certain amount of pressure to keep your job, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but if you can recognize um, why the boss is triggering you, um, you can do a better job of protecting yourself than you can if you don't know that your boss is triggering you. Or my patient who was hospitalized at the university 60 times, when we figured out it was her mother who was triggering her, you know, she was able to set some boundaries that she wasn't going to tolerate this uh, emotionally and verbally abusive behavior from mom anymore. Uh, a key foundation for being able to set those boundaries is getting to the place where you believe you're, you don't deserve uh, to be triggered, where you feel like you are a, a worthy enough human being um, that you shouldn't have to put up with whatever the triggering person uh, is doing. Right. Uh, so that we go back to that self-esteem uh, foundation that I'm trying to build up people's uh, sense of themselves as a, a powerful, valuable person who's, uh, again, done the moral equivalent of surviving a dangerous jungle as a kid and should take tremendous pride in having done that. And mm -hmm. when you have that inner sense of your own value, it makes it a lot easier to say, I am not uh, putting up with this crap anymore. Right. Yes. It's so, so true. And I, I've noticed too, and maybe you can help people with this, is that a lot of times when people see triggers or they, they, mm -hmm. they get triggered once, they put up a wall and then they make that wall so nobody could hurt them. But yet even the good people can't get in because they have this barrier so that because they don't want to get hurt anymore and they, this wall has become so thick and and high it reminds me like a, the medieval castle where you have the big cement wall up and it's just as soon as it comes up there it's not that easy to break it down anymore and you know instead of having that that wall you know how could people like learn to break that wall down but yet protect themselves so they don't have to put a wall up and let the other people you know that are that are good that are positive that it would be you know someone that would be a benefit to their life actually come in and be able to get close to them because so many people have pushed people out and they don't care if they're good or bad they've been hurt they've been triggered and nobody's coming near me anymore yeah, and I see that, and this may not be true for everybody, but in, in my particular patients, uh, where I see that wall is when they are in the process of a major change in self-image. And they have, when you have a very poor self-image, when you're thinking of yourself as a second-rate human being or a worthless piece of crap that you've been, uh, that has been planted in your brain from an early age, and you suddenly realize, you know what? 
uh, that's not appropriate. That's not true. Uh, that's not right. That's not who I am. Uh, and I need to change that. And uh, before they change it, typically they're going to be in one rotten relationship after another. They're going to be, uh, they, they may have grown up with constantly focusing on solving other people's problems, um, being surrounded by people who've got lots of problems that need to be solved. And that's the kind of person they choose to be in their life. Once they realize, no, I'm not doing that anymore. I need to uh, completely revamp my self-image. They're going to put that wall up because they they don't trust themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, they know they've gone from one rotten relationship to another. They don't want that anymore. So they're going to keep everybody out for a period of time until they feel uh, grounded and until they feel like they've made that 180 degree flip in their self-image and they can look at themselves as you know the the heroes of their own lives that they've right. shown that perseverance uh, to have gotten through all the rottenness that has come before and they wake up in the morning and look in the mirror and see uh, a hero yeah and once they get to that place they can take the wall down um I, one story of, about a patient uh, who did that was um, she had been in relationships almost continuously for years, um, but they were all bad. Right. Uh, so she put the wall up and she went for a year and a half, um, not with anybody, um, and just reprocessing who she thought of herself as. Right. And then she met this guy at a party, lots of other people, um, had a nice chat with him. And when he asked her out, um, he, she said yes. Um, and she had really not dated much in, in a year and a half. Uh, I love this story. They, mm -hmm. they go to a restaurant. They get there at six o'clock. They're having dinner and the, start talking. And the next thing she knows, the waiter comes over and he says, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. And she goes, what for? Uh, we just got here. And he, he said, I'm sorry, but it's 11 o'clock and we're closing. <laughs> <laughs> and those two have been happily married now for over a decade. Oh, that's wonderful. I like that story a lot. Oh, it's nice to hear stuff like that because, you know, you want people to, everyone deserves to be happy. Everyone deserves to live uh, a life that they, that they just that happy, healthy, you know, uh, fulfilling life that, you know, they could feel good about themselves and, and have that self-esteem. And because everybody is a wonderful person, everyone has wonderful qualities about them. And it's, it's up to that person to go inside themselves and to let those those beautiful qualities shine. And if they go in through rough spots and if they're not doing the right thing, there's always room for change and there's always room to better yourself. But, you know, it, it hurts when you see people going through those type of things. So yeah, and it hurts when people come in to see the doctor and, and the doctor thinks, you know, this person doesn't have anything physically wrong with them. It's in their heads. They're weak. They're neurotic. They can't handle their own stress. Uh, and, you know, the reality is the opposite of that. These, these patients are some of the strongest people I know. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're like Olympic weightlifters mm -hmm. uh, in terms of their strength. Uh, they've just been asked to carry, you know, 50 pounds more than the world record for their weight class right. uh, in stress. And so, of course, they feel weak and, and their bodies break down. But once they learn, okay, that that extra weight is on there, and we learn how to put that weight down, then they see how strong they have been all along. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now, if we go back, we go back a couple of steps to where we were. Do you remember what the next step is? You know, I think we've you've led me right through um, most Did of I really? the steps here. <laughs> yeah. Um, we identify the stress and then we treat the three different kinds of stresses. Um, you know, we haven't, we actually haven't touched on depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. Yes. It's amazing how often um, those w conditions, which we think of as mental health conditions, but actually, if you take the whole universe of those conditions, um, most of the people who have them will manifest in their bodies. Yeah. And so they'll go to a medical doctor instead of a mental health professional. Right. Uh, and the medical doctor will focus on the body uh, and they might get a superficial evaluation for the mental health condition. Uh, but, you know, countless patients of mine uh, who have suffered absolutely definite depression or anxiety or post-traumatic stress, they'll, 
initially tell me, no, I don't feel depressed. Yeah. Uh, or I'm, you know, I don't feel anxious, but they've been anxious for so many years, it just feels normal to them. So yeah. there's, oh, I, I don't feel that anxious. Um, but um, the key there is that their symptoms are much worse, uh, more severe, more frequent whenever they're away from a safe environment. Right. Uh, one of my patients just very simply um, uh, was having a, a bowel attacks, uh, we can call them. Uh, and they were happening two or three times a week uh, for the past nine months. And nobody could figure out why. Well, uh, because I take very detailed histories of exactly when and where the symptoms are occurring, I found out that she didn't have any uh, when she was at home. And home for her was a safe place. Mm -hmm. Leaving home, it would trigger her anxiety. But, you know, she spent waking and sleeping 50% of her time at home. So uh, her bowel attacks, 50% of those should have taken place at home if it was just something in the bowel. Because right. the bowel doesn't know if you're at home or away. You know, it's dark <laughs> in there. We, we got to bring our own light when we go in to look around. Uh -huh. uh, but she had 100% of her attacks took place away from home. And there just isn't anything else that will do that but an anxiety disorder. So yeah. very important to check for that. And the and the trauma, you got to ask about trauma. Did the person go through a, a trauma? I got I got great stories about trauma if we have time. Oh, sure. Go ahead. All right. So my favorite story, actually, the, the, the easy ones are when the trauma happened, like the woman with the pistol at her neck, the symptoms began right after the trauma. And you just have to ask, did you go through a terrifying or horrifying event? The more challenging ones are when the trauma happened a long time before they became ill. Yeah. And this was a woman who had belly pains and, uh, and also with, with vomiting, to, to be honest, uh, she had that as well. And she would be seen in the emergency room. She'd get all the tests and they were always normal. And so I asked her about trauma. It's part of my, my routine. And she had witnessed the shooting of her brother. And this had happened a, a full decade before she became ill. Uh, the brother, it turned out, had been shot um, in the right lower corner of his abdomen. Oh, when wow. I asked her where her belly pain was, she formed her hand into this shape, the shape of a pistol. Wow. If you just the audio. She pointed her the barrel of this pistol at the right lower corner of her abdomen to show me where the pain was. Very unusual gesture. Didn't know the significance of it until I asked her about trauma and she told me about the brother. But the shooting had taken place 10 years before she became ill. So, you know, could it possibly be connected? Uh, what I ask people about in that situation is, did something happen to you right before your illness began or your pain uh, that was in some way connected uh, to the trauma that, that could have served as a trigger for your illness? Right. Uh, and immediately she knew because right before her illness began, she had encountered her brother's killer in a store. Uh, wow. He had been, you know, arrested, convicted, served eight or nine years for manslaughter and was released back oh, into the community. Wow. And nobody had warned her that he was back out there. Wow. That could definitely be a trigger point, more than a trigger point. Bring no an anxiety attack, everything you can think of. Oh my God. The whole nine sure. yards. Yeah. Wow. But if you don't know to look for these things, you know, all the other doctors who'd seen her for three years had missed it. Yeah. And it's amazing how, you know, that that's the sad thing about when it comes to the medical field, they don't train doctors to really go del delve, dive, dive deeper into the, the, the root cause of the problem. It's, you know, they focus more on the medical aspect but they don't really look for the correlation or the root cause that could be actually causing the physical illness or the mental illness that the person is actually going through. It is, it is just hard to believe. And, and my first seven years of training, I didn't believe it. Um, just how ill you can get uh, from stress. Um, one of my patients was a 17 year old. I was asked to see on uh, her 70th day in the hospital. Uh, for ab unexplained abdominal pain. Um, I was, you know, she had had this for a year and a half. I was the seventh gastrointestinal specialist to be asked to see her. She was getting morphine around the clock in, in huge doses, the kind of doses wow. you'd give a, a dying cancer patient, for example. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, this is, a, it was as bad as it gets. And it was 100% from stress. Wow. 
Wow. That's amazing. So what if, if we had to focus on, you know, so when, when it's affecting people and it's affecting their depression, it's affecting them, their anxiety is affect, it affects their, their um, depression. It affects um, panic attacks. You know, uh, do you still use the same steps that we've gone over to help those, those, those three, three medical conditions? And, and they were as just going back to the root cause, figuring out why they're feeling those, those three, three different conditions and the things we went over are are usually the things that will help them get through the, those issues yeah absolutely i mean the the ch most challenging part of this whole process is to find that stress find that stress that is creating the patient's illness because once you bring that out into the open usually the uh, treatment process that they need is um, fairly straightforward by comparison i mean we can use standard treatment methods, whether it's counseling or medication or both for depression, for anxiety disorders, for post-traumatic stress, they're well-established techniques for taking care of those things. Um, the, the biggest difficulty is to show that there's a connection between a significant amount of depression and uh, the physical symptoms that are going on. But once the patient sees that, uh, they're willing to undergo the treatment uh, for the mental health condition, or for the childhood trauma, yeah. or for the stress that's in a person's life uh, right now, um, and they'll see the improvement. Even if it, you know, some of my patients get better very, very quickly. Uh, the woman with the um, uh, nausea, vomiting, and dizziness that was triggered by her mom, she was cured on the spot after wow. 15 years, uh, a one-hour conversation, and it was over. Uh, but other people, they need, you know, years of psychotherapy, but they know that they're on a pathway uh, toward getting better. And the number of times they need to visit the doctor goes way, way down. Now, it's, you know, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's, it's, it's a, I, I actually, you know, recommend going to a doctor that could kind of guide you through it and help you find the root cause. But are there anything that people can do at home if they know there's something triggering them? You know, if they're out of that denial stage, if they're conscious and they know there's something going on and it's deep rooted and they're not sure, is there things they could do at home? Like we talked about journaling or there is there is there any type of activities they could try to figure out for themselves, you know, what is the root cause? What's, you know, causing these problems? Or is this something that we should just actually just go to a, a doctor like yourself and just go step by step and, and, and work your way through? Yeah, everybody's different, but, uh, you know, I'm I'm not a good promoter of my own resources because I haven't mentioned any of them up to now, but uh, my nonprofit's website of endchronicpain.org, it starts with a 12-item a quiz that takes oh, cool. people less than three minutes uh, to fill out. And each question on the quiz has some uh, information that explains the, the meaning of the question. Uh, and the more of those questions to which you answer yes, uh, the more likely it is that one of these issues uh, is going on. And the questions themselves will start to point you uh, in the right direction. And then after that, we've got uh, courses on there. Uh, we have um, books that people can read. Uh, some, you know, there's my own, they can't find anything wrong. There's a number by my colleagues that are uh, uh, self-help and they're all scientifically evidence-based. Uh, we've got webinar-based courses on um, May 16th. I don't know when, uh, 2024, I don't know when you're going to be posting uh, our interview today. Oh, this, but... this will be up soon. So Okay, there's there's an open webinar. Uh, the 16th is only like, like Thursday, I think, uh, this week. But uh, we've got an open webinar. You know, It's open to the entire world uh, for free where I'm going to be answering people's questions. Um, uh, there are going to be probably over 200 people there, but... Uh, uh, the questions that pe that get answered uh, during the hour uh, will apply to uh, lots of people who don't get their questions in. Uh, so we're we're always coming up with more resources. We've got a um, a live conference uh, with um, I think it's almost twenty international experts coming to Boulder, Colorado on September twenty sixth for two days oh, of wonderful. presentations. Um, on just this topic and going into uh, lots more depth than we have time for today. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. I love it. Oh, this is amazing. Now, if if um, you had to really summarize everything we talked about today and you wanted to emphasize on a couple of important aspects, what would be some of the things you'd like to share with the listeners that you'd really like them to understand? 
You know, the whole thing starts with, you know, the first domino uh, idea is that the brain can cause real pain or illness anywhere in the body. And in fact, commonly uh, can do it in more than one place at a time, or that the uh, physical symptom can move from place to place or be exacerbated by stress. But just the fact that the brain can do this to the body and that it does this because of stress, that's kind of the next domino to fall. Yeah. And then to find uh, what the stress is, uh, whether it's in your in the present day uh, or it was from adverse childhood experience or it's an undiagnosed case of depression or anxiety or there's been a trauma, you know, following this this chain of logic uh, back uh, will just, you know, as it did for me as a, as a young doctor, just opens up a, a whole world of uh, therapeutic benefits that I had no idea existed. I am uh, lifelong indebted to Dr. Kaplan for teaching me this. Wow. That's amazing. I, I'm so glad that Dr. Kaplan taught you this so you could be here today and teach everybody who's listening. Cause I think this is something that we all, we all go through stress in life. Everybody has stresses in their life. Everybody gets stuck in life. Everybody has obstacles. It's just learn how to cope with them. And if you are you getting, you know, if, if something in your life is causing you so much distress that it's affecting your health mentally or physically, then you know that you need to take action. If you're not happy, if you don't want to get out of bed, if you're feeling fatigue, if, if, you know, if you're not your normal self, you know, or you may not even notice it, but if people are saying what's wrong and not acting like yourself, you know, don't be, you know, don't get offensive, you know, think about it and say, well, how am I different? And then maybe, you know, start to maybe jot down some of the, the things that people are saying and, and, and maybe, you know, look at yourself a little deeper inside yourself and make sure that, you know, your stresses aren't causing you, you know, problems in your, in your daily life. Because if you keep letting things go on, I assume it just gets worse in my, in my book. I always see that it just triggers to become worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And some of my patients have been ill for years or decades until the underlying cause was found. Um, one of my patients, 55 years, uh, and he was cured in 30 days. That's amazing. These symptoms, I emphasize, they are just as real as any other form of illness. Right. Yes. I, I agree 100 percent. And you know what? They there's so many beliefs and even the, the Asians talk about it and, they, you know, and they have different different ways, you know, like they, these type of, of, of uh, you know, mythologies and, and ideas and, you know, it's been going on for thousands of years that, you know, it, it's not something new that, you know, it's just been pulled out of a hat. You know, they, you know, years, thousands of years ago when people had shoulder pain, well, what's your stress? Are you carrying too much stress on your shoulders? You know, those little Little, those little analogies, but it was meant because, you know, people would get pain in certain areas when they had so, too many stresses and headaches for certain things. And, you know, it, it people don't realize, but you, these little symptoms carry out, like you said, from things going, looking it back at the root cause, you know. Yeah. Now, there's a uh, an Egyptian papyrus from 1800 BC, so almost 4,000 years old. Mm -hmm. that describes a lot of these same symptoms. Yes. Uh, and, you know, in those days, they thought that it was the uterus that was doing all of this. <laughs> right? So their their theories were not exactly up to date. But yeah. the actual care of people that have this, to be honest, has not improved very much since then. Right. Uh, my nonprofit is trying to change that, you know, bring us... Bring us 4,000 years into the future here. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I'm so glad you're doing it. And I'm very excited. And if people want to contact you, I assume they can just go on your website and contact you with any questions. And yeah, info at ppdassociation.org. PPD is our abbreviation for psychophysiologic disorders, which is a blend of psychology and physiology. Um, but you can you know, go to endchronicpain.org. That's a lot easier to remember. And um, you can reach us from there. And they can sign up for your webinar as well on there. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to be doing those every three months that they'll be open. And then if you be, sign up and become a member and you know pay a nominal uh, dues amount, uh, you can come to webinars that we run every single month. And they're a lot smaller. So your question is uh, more likely to get answered. 
Oh, that's wonderful. And is there anything right now on your website that do you have any checklists or any anything that you give away or any downloads right now that if people want to come on your website or a newsletter or anything that they could sign up for? Yeah, you know, all you have to do is that uh, 12 item quiz, which is, you know, educational in and of itself. And you give us your email address uh, when you have that. And we'll start sending you stuff. And if you don't like it, just unsubscribe. But, uh, <laughs> if you have listened all the way to this part of your podcast, uh, I'm betting that you're going to find the information is really, really useful. <laughs> Well, this has been a pleasure, Dr. Clark. I am so glad you came on the show. I hope you'll come back one day and we could talk more in depth about a lot of these things that we mentioned. We talked about a lot of different topics today in one podcast, but maybe you'll come back and we can talk some more and go into depth about a lot of these issues because these are things that I think people need a lot of help with. And it's very prevalent in our society and people, you know, they suffer from chronic pain every day of their lives. And, you know, to be able to live, you know, chronic free of pain and to be able to enjoy life is, is a blessing. So I thank you for what you do. I thank you for all the effort and time you put into helping these people. And I thank you very much for being on our podcast. You've been a wonderful guest and I thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, same here. You have a great day.